Hello and welcome back to a new video about abstract linear algebra. The video series where we talk a lot about linear algebra for general vector spaces. And in fact, in today's part 12, we will continue talking about inner products. In particular, we will discuss the important cauchy schwarz inequality. However, you already know, before we do that, I first want to thank all the nice people who support this channel on Steady, here on YouTube or on Patreon. And please don't forget, as a supporter, you can download the PDF versions and quizzes for all the videos with the link in the description. Okay, then let's start by telling you what we already know. Everything today will be about an inner product on an f-vector space v. And usually we denote such an inner product with pointed brackets. And it gets exactly two vectors as an input and a scalar is the output of an inner product. And if we have that and the three properties we have discussed in part 10, then we can call this map an inner product. Moreover, we also discussed the special case of inner products in Fn. There, any inner product can be expressed with the standard inner product. This means if we put in two vectors y and x, then we find a positive definite matrix A such that the general inner product here is equal to the standard inner product where we have the matrix A inside. However, please don't forget the important ingredient. This matrix has to be positive definite. Okay, and at this point you might ask, what can we do with inner products in linear algebra? And answering this question is even important if you only want to work with the standard inner product in Fn. Therefore, you should know having an inner product on our vector space V allows us to measure angles in V. So suddenly we get geometry for an object that before only had algebraic operations. Hence, with an inner product, the vector space V becomes much more interesting because now it's a geometric object. And now exactly there, the cauchy schwarz inequality comes in because it will explain what we actually mean by angles in V. So you see, it's worth it to have a whole video about this inequality here. However, I should also tell you that this geometric approach here also includes lengths. So having an inner product implies that we can also measure distances in the vector space V. And we can immediately understand that due to the first property of an inner product. Indeed, the positive definite property allows us to define a positive number for every x in V. More precisely, the zero vector is the exception because it produces the number zero. So I think you already know what we want to do here. We want to take the inner product and put x in both factors. Hence, the outcome here is a non-negative number that could represent the length of the vector x. However, in order to get the correct dimension or unit, one usually puts a square root on top. And with that, we get a new object here and we call it the norm of the vector x. Indeed, the norm as an object is also an important concept that can be generalized, but this is something for another video. Here, it's just important to remember that an inner product immediately gives a norm. So a thing that can measure lengths. Okay, so now each vector in the vector space has a corresponding length and this leads us to the cauchy schwarz inequality. Indeed, I can already tell you this inequality is so important because it's so general and you can use it in a lot of different branches of mathematics. The only thing we need is an inner product in a real or complex vector space V. And now the statement is that the inner product between two vectors x and y can be estimated by their lengths. More concretely, the absolute value of this inner product is less or equal than the product of the lengths of x and y. So you see, multiplying the norms of x and y is never smaller than the inner product of both vectors. And in fact, usually it is larger because the equality here 
only holds for some special cases. This only applies if x and y are linearly dependent. So we only have that in the case that x and y lie on one line. Hence, with this statement you can already see why an inner product can measure angles, because this is definitely the angle of 0 or 180 degrees. And if you want, you can use the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality here to define the angle between x and y. Okay, but before we do that, we should first talk about the proof of Cauchy-Schwarz. And there I can tell you, in my functional analysis series, you can already find a proof of this statement. For this reason, I want to show you an alternative proof in this video here. And let's immediately start with the simple case that x is given by the zero vector. Then we can immediately calculate this inner product here because the vector x can be written as the scalar zero times any vector we want and maybe we just call it v. It does not really matter because the point is that we can pull out the scalar zero here. This is the linearity in the second factor for the inner product. And now we have 0 times any real or complex number is obviously 0. Hence, if the 0 vector is involved in the inner product, the outcome of the inner product is definitely 0. Moreover, we also see that the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality is definitely satisfied because the right hand side is also equal to 0. So you see, this was a simple case and we got it out of the way. So in the second case, x will be not equal to the zero vector. So this is the general case and now we are allowed to divide by the norm of x if we want. And indeed, if we do that on both sides of our Cauchy-Schwarz inequality here, the whole inequality looks a little bit simpler. Simply because we can pull in the scalar into the second factor of the inner product. And then we only have the norm of y on the right hand side. And if we want, we can call this new vector in the inner product x hat. And now it's important to note that the norm of x hat is equal to 1. So that's an easy calculation one can simply do. In other words, if we can show the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality for vectors x with norm 1, we have shown the general form as well. Hence, this is exactly what we will do and therefore we will fix a scalar lambda here and it should be a real number. This means if f is given by the complex numbers, we only choose scalars here that have imaginary part 0. Indeed, we do that to make our equations a little bit simpler. Okay, and now what we can immediately say is that our inner product with the same input left and right is definitely greater or equal than zero. And the input I want is y minus lambda x hat. So the idea here is simply that we subtract both vectors, but we also have a scaling factor involved. And now we can simply split the whole thing up by using the linearity in both factors. There, please don't forget, the inner product is only conjugate linear in the first factor, but this is not so important here because we only choose real factors. Hence, what we get here are exactly four terms and the first one is y, y. Then we get minus lambda x hat with y and minus lambda times y with x hat. And then the last term is plus lambda squared x hat with x hat. So there you see we have four terms and we can put the middle ones together. This is not hard to see because if we call the third term simply alpha then we can recognize that the second term here is the complex conjugate of alpha. Again this is just using the properties of the inner product. Okay. And then I would say, let's simplify this equation here. First, the last term is simply lambda squared. This is because we have the norm of x squared here and this is equal to one. Okay, and then the middle term we can also put together. We have lambda times 
minus two times the real part of the inner product y with x hat. Indeed, this is simply what you get if you add a complex number to the complex conjugate number. The imaginary part vanishes and you have the real part two times. Okay, and then the last thing is y in the norm squared. Okay, and there we have it. This is a quadratic polynomial in our scalar lambda. And there you should know that such a polynomial has zeros, at most two. And indeed, this formula is not hard to remember if you call the constants here p and q. Then the general solution for the two zeros lambda 1, lambda 2 is given by minus p half plus or minus a square root. And inside this square root we have p half squared minus the constant q. Now this is a general formula you should have in mind and now we can use it to solve our problem here. And here please note we already know that the quadratic polynomial here is greater or equal than zero for every point lambda in R. This means if we sketch the graph of this polynomial we get two different cases. Either the parabola lies completely above the x-axis or it touches the x-axis with exactly one point. Otherwise it would not be possible to fulfill greater or equal than zero for every lambda in R. Hence here in our solution formula it's not possible that we find two different solutions. This means we either have one real solution or none at all. So in conclusion what we have inside the square root here has to be less or equal than zero. Otherwise we would find two real solutions and that's not possible. So the implication we have is that this is less or equal than zero. And by putting in p and q we get that the real part of the inner product here squared is less or equal than the norm of y squared. And then you see in the next step we can simply take the square root on both sides. And then we get that the absolute value of this inner product is less or equal than the norm of y. And this is almost what we wanted to show because only this real part here now has to vanish. And indeed this happens if our field of scalars is given by the real numbers. So we have proven Cauchy-Schwarz for real vector spaces now. However, for complex vector spaces it's also almost done because we only have to rotate a little bit with complex numbers. Namely, if we have a complex number here given by an inner product then we can always write it as the absolute value of this complex number. The only thing we have to do is to rotate the complex number such that we lie on the real number line then. And such a rotation is possible with a complex number with modulus 1. So we could call it e to the power i phi but maybe let's write c. Okay and now since both sides here represent real numbers we can also put the real part in again. This means the left hand side here is equal to the real part of c times the inner product and since we know it's non-negative we can also write it with an absolute value. Okay and now the only thing we have to do is to pull in the c into the second factor. And again we see here in the second factor we have a vector that has a norm that is equal to 1 and maybe let's call this vector x tilde. However there we can now use our previous result where we know this is less or equal than the norm of y. And then you should recognize now we also have proven the general formula for complex vector spaces. Okay there we have it. This is the whole proof of this important inequality. And if you are interested in seeing another proof you can watch part 10 in my functional analysis course. So I really hope this was helpful and then let's meet in the next videos where we talk more about inner products. Namely we will talk about orthogonal projections. So have a nice day and see you soon. Bye bye.